The context from which I draw my title, eccentric to the ends of his master or state, is that of the essay of Wisdom for a Man's Self by Francis Bacon. The word eccentric, both as adjective and as substantive, has developed significantly since the first couple of decades of the 17th century, due mainly to 19th century advances in steam power and steam traction and the introduction of the piston and slide valve. In Bacon's time, the term was applied scientifically to planetary orbits in Ptolemaic astronomy to an orbit not having the Earth precisely at its center, in Copernican astronomy, an orbit not having the Sun precisely at its center. I heard Simon Seabag Montefiore on BBC Newsnight, 9th of February, taking observations on the popular uprising in Cairo. He said that in its early stages, revolution is an asymmetrical force. I particularly noted the phrase as I was already thinking about this lecture. And he went on that this asymmetrical force is inexorably subsumed into a subsequent symmetrical stage as the centralizing bureaucrats of revolution take charge, which I think we can see already happening. This is a late figurative application of the idea of eccentric versus concentric forces of which I shall have more to say in next term's lecture. According to the current OED, the phrase from Bacon is the earliest recorded instance of a figurative sense of the word eccentric. It has little in common with the eccentric forces with which I shall be dealing in my third lecture. The OED glosses eccentric in Bacon's usage as not agreeing, having little in common with. I would make it even stronger. I would call it a thwart, deviant, thwarting, working across or against. Bacon in context is describing or inventing or purporting to discover a public domain of untrustworthy, crooked servants, whether of great men or of the state, the kind of hireling who, as he says, crooketh affairs to his own ends, which must needs be eccentric to the ends of his master or state, deliberately crossing or thwarting. Bacon's intention in this essay appears as the discovery of a politic viciousness very similar to that which Walter Raleigh covers with a different term in Book One, Chapter One of The History of the World, 1614. Raleigh writes there of riches and honor given to external men and without kernel. Bacon's eccentric servant who thwarts his master is correspondingly oxymoronically to Raleigh's external man. Both terms are intended as insults, of course. Raleigh makes it clear that external equates the fashioning of ourselves according to the nature of the time wherein we live. 
which activity is a byproduct of that inherent sinfulness, Philip Sidney's infected will, original sin, which alienates us first from that inco incomprehensible wisdom which we express by the name of God or fate or fortune, and secondly, from ourselves. Raleigh's theological eclecticism enables him to unite the judgment of St. Augustine with that of Seneca and the doctrine of the Stoics and with a seasoning of Machiavelli, whom Bacon realistically admired. My purpose in giving precedence here to Bacon and Raleigh is twofold. First, to indicate the way in which the English poetry I most deeply care about in the period 1520-1720, and that I most desire to set before you in further lectures, exists in relationship at times explicit, at other times tacit, to the theological, ethical, and political timbres found in the discursive prose of the times. Secondly, to stress, as I did in my inaugural lecture, the centrality of Shakespeare's sonnets, as I understand them, to the overriding intelligence of that age, and to suggest that the concerns of writers such as Bacon and Raleigh help to illuminate key factors in those sonnets and in turn are illuminated by them. I am not, I must stress, implying direct transference. Two phrases from the sonnets, I could quote numbers more, where time and outward form would show it dead, sonnet 108, with my extern, the outward honouring, sonnet 125, are peripherally applicable to Bacon's phrasing in the essay and are entirely consonant with Raleigh's emphasis in Book 1, Chapter 1 of the History of the World. The sonnets by Shakespeare that encounter the double betrayal, not only by the young man and the young woman, but by the young woman with the young man, are entirely terrible. They are delivered with what we call a shit-eating grin, since 1B, of course, of shitty in grin, ingratiating, embarrassed, or uncomfortable expression, especially as exhibited by someone undergoing a humiliating experience. A shitty eating grin. <laughs> Perhaps the only bit of our contemporary vernacular that the age of Nash, Bacon, and Raleigh would have approved and applauded. <laughs> Sonnet 140, one of the Dark Lady sequence. Be wise as thou art cruel. Do not press my tongue-tied patience with too much disdain, lest sorrow lend me words and words express the manner of my pity-wanting pain. If I might teach thee wit, better it were, though not to love, yet love to tell me so, as testy sick men when their deaths be near. No news but health from their physicians know. For if I should despair, I should go mad. And in my madness might speak ill of thee. 
Now this ill-resting world is grown so bad, mad slanderers by mad ears, believe it be. That I may not be so, nor thou belied. Bear thine eyes straight, though thy proud heart go wide. For if I should despair, I should grow mad. Shakespeare writes of himself as nakedly, as brutally as he writes of Othello, and less charitably than he speaks of Malvolio. This sonnet, Sonnet 140, is also one. There are numerous others in Shakespeare, some in Sydney, some in Wyatt, where you feel that the inherent flaw in this particular sonnet form, three quatrains and a final couplet, has been overcome by the through drive of cumulative energy. To succeed as here, the final couplet must seem the logical, or as often with poetry, the pseudo-logical consummation of the preceding 12 lines, not as a pathetic attempt to answer back. Final couplets that try to answer back have an overriding tendency to sound merely flippant or petty. Put yourself in the place of Shakespeare, Sidney, Samuel Daniel, Michael Drayton. Facing the conventions of the age that embraces and stifles you. The English sonnet form that threatens to make you a laughing stock with its idiotically malign final couplet. All this must be mastered in addition to the infected will of etymology and your deep personal sense that you're a fool and a bungler. Viewing the question more positively, one could say that the three quatrains plus couplets on it, whatever its inadequacies, established a convention and once there is a form of conventional utterance, there is also a dramatis persona which can be deliberately threatened, put to the test by the poet's other dramatis personae. If you are Sydney, these would be yourself, Stella, grief, lust, self-blame. If you are Shakespeare, the other dramatis personae would be yourself, the young man, the dark lady, the rival poet, grief, lust, self-blame. It's my impression that some of the most memorable poetry of this period and perhaps of subsequent periods, such as the Augustan, articulates itself around the oxymoron, the sharp, blunt dichotomy. The paradox, as I read it, opens out as in Matthew 10.39, which I hear quote from the text of Shakespeare's principal Bible, the Geneva of 1560. He that will save his life shall lose it, and he that loseth this life for my sake shall save it. And as in the splendid affirmation of Shakespeare's close contemporary, the Jesuit mission priest Robert Southall, our tears shall be turned into triumph, our disgrace into glory, all our miseries into perfect felicity. 
The oxymoron binds us ever tighter into our carnal condition with a locked antithesis. And here I take several instances once more from Robert Southall. Loathed pleasures, disordered order, pleasing horror, baleful bliss, cruel comforts. And three examples from Shakespeare's sonnets. Lascivious grace, pitiful thrivers, but love, hate on. Let me repeat, this is my impression not my demonstration of a fact. I think there might be unanswerable exceptions placed before me by a strict grammarian. And I acknowledge that five lines from the end of a satire against reason and mankind, Rochester uses paradox, where I would think oxymoron. I wouldn't write oxymoron, it would screw up the scansion, but I would think oxymoron. And when I read the concluding lines of the 71st sonnet of Sydney's Astrophil and Stella, so while thy beauty draws the heart to love, as fast thy virtue bends that love to good, but ah, desire still cries, give me some food. I wish to claim that Sydney, in placing the word food oxymoronically in relation to the word good, food here represents raw desire, will, lust, and good weakly represents an ideal set of platonizing values about love that the speaker struggles to maintain. If there is a broad moral meaning behind or within two such sonnet sequences as Shakespeare's and Sidney's, it would appear to be the observation that poets fabricate. Fabricate in the sense of put together, and as in, that is a total fabrication. And that to fabricate is to do something which is simultaneously both good and bad. You're building a fabric which may well endure to be applauded in a lecture hall more than 400 years hence, though admittedly by a superannuated crank. <laughs> and you are spinning a tissue of self-delusion or downright lies around your loves and yourself. Your poem is a dramatist persona because it is there to be confided in, argued against, hated for what its programmed rhyme schemes twist you into confessing. I'm here choosing to understand the verb to fashion and the substantive fashion in a double sense and to argue that much of the power of the poetry I here admire is fully aware of the double sense and draw sustenance from the ambiguity. For fashion as verb, meaning to make, to structure, we have Edmund Spencer's letter to Raleigh, included in the first edition 1590 of books one to three of the Fairy Queen, where he says, the general end therefore of all the book is to fashion a gentleman or noble person in virtuous and gentle discipline. Now for a terse allusion to fashion as mode, mere bodishness, as being a la mode, we go back some 60 years from that to the Henrician courtier poet Thomas Wyatt. But all is torrent thorough my gentleness, into a strange fashion of forsaking. 
Modiness as a weapon of estrangement. Does Wyatt consider that in fashioning a poet, a poem out of estrangement, he is furthering the estrangement? Is writing itself a form of self-estrangement? What does Sidney intend when in the last line of Sonnet 19 he writes, Scholar saith love, bend hitherward your wit. Or in the last line of 28 of Astrophil and Stella, love only reading unto me this art. Or in the last three lines of 44, the heavenly nature of that place is such that once come there, the sobs of minor noise are metamorphosed straight to tunes of joys. The theme of metamorphosis was current at the time through Golding's weirdly beautiful translation of Ovid and by way of alchemy's claims to transubstantiate base metals into gold. But for a powerful early sense in English of the sonnet sequence working as a type of metamorphic process, I would cite Sidney composed circa 1582, published 1591. A year previous to the unauthorized appearance in print of Sidney's sequence, Spencer had written in his letter to Raleigh, I have thought good as well for avoiding of jealous opinions and misconstructions, as also for your better light in reading thereof, being so by you commanded, to discover unto you the general intention and meaning which is the whole course thereof I have fashioned. Here, as I've previously suggested, the verb to fashion means to structure an ethos and a language to contain it. You could safely say, I think, that the general intention and meaning of the fairy queen is to propose to our admiration the diametrical opposite of everything that Bacon means by shows, outward accidents, impedimenta, works of ostentation, a state which must be looked into. And what Raleigh alludes to in describing those men having nothing else to value themselves by but a counterfact kind of wondering at other men, and by making them believe that all their vices are virtues, and all their dusty actions crystalline, have yet in all ages prospered equally with the most virtuous, if not exceeded them. Spencer, who despite the reaction that some readers have to him, to what seems the inordinate ramifications of his allegory, nonetheless can be admirably pithy, writes of moral gluttony, let grill be grill and have his hoggish mind. But even this, Pithy as it is, is not the same as Shakespeare and Sidney confessing that they contain a grill within themselves and that a certain proportion of their magnificent art is given over to grillish fabrications. In so doing, they push the range of poetic articulation beyond the reach of contemporary criticism, though Sidney himself did very well with his erected wit, infected will oxymoron, which I cited in my inaugural lecture and to which I shall undoubtedly return on subsequent occasions. In William Webb's A Discourse of English Poetry, 1586, 
a characteristic term for work he believes he ought to admire, is sweet. He is not alone, one recalls Francis Mears in 1598, praising mellifluous and honey-tongued Shakespeare as one in whom the sweet, witty soul of Ovid lives, in witness to which he cites his Venus and Adonis, his Lucrece, his sugared sonnets among his private friends, etc. I like the etc. It makes him the E. Cummings of the 16th century. <laughs> Who the hell is E. Cummings? <laughs> Webb writes of Orpheus, who by the sweet gift of his heavenly poetry withdrew men from ranging uncertainly and wandering brutishly about. That's worth repeating. Orpheus, who by the sweet gift of his heavenly poetry withdrew men from ranging uncertainly and wandering brutishly about. Sixty-five years later, in Leviathan, 1651, Thomas Hobbes stated that ranging uncertainly and wandering brutishly about, or similar words to that effect, was the hateful condition of primitive mankind before the foundation of civil societies. By placing a verse from the book of Job on his title page, Hobbes clearly indicates his title's source. Leviathan is in Job. It is nonetheless possible, I think, that he had simultaneously somewhere in mind Webb's source. It was a 16th century literary commonplace, and Hobbes certainly knew his classics. Horace's Art of Poetry, the line celebrating both Orpheus and Amphion, as poet musicians and founders of civil society. I here quote Ben Jonson's fine translation. Orpheus, a priest and speaker for the gods, first frighted men that wildly lived at odds from slaughter and foul life. And for the same was tigers said and lions fierce to tame. Amphion too, that built the Theban towers, was said to move the stones by his lute's powers, and lead them with sweet songs where that he would. In which case, Hobbes would be the Orpheus Amphion of the new absolutism that built the Theban towers and tamed the beasts, behemoth, and leviathan. Setting that conjecture aside, half a century or more before Hobbes, a critic of deep per perception, not Mears or Webb, obviously, but a critic of deep perception might have discerned from Ovid's metamorphoses, if nothing else. Wondrously English, as I've said, by Arthur Golding in 1565-7, published 1567-1593, that they might have gleaned from Ovid's metamorphoses that the poetic language of the coming age would be, had to be, a dramatic containment and expression of mankind's ranging uncertainly and wandering brutishly about. Spencer has such passages in The Fairy Queen. The genius of Shakespeare's greatest sonnets, the dates of composition are notoriously uncertain, may have been taught him by his own middle tragedies 
and dark comedies. Their power lies in their compressed, inventive presentation of a distracted will, distracted will, that compacted, irreducible oxymoron of proud selfhood, Will Shakespeare, and almost impersonal, libidinal urge, sufficiently in command of itself in the midst of humiliated misery to master the equipage, the equipage, as he terms it in Sonnet 32 of the sonnet form, so that it would never be outmastered even by the holy sonnets of John Donne. I am indebted to the Duncan Jones Arden edition of Shakespeare's sonnets, 1997, for its annotations, and especially for pages 72-74 of the introduction, where she writes, the only early 17th century writer who can be shown to have read the 1609 quarto of the sonnets, Shakespeare's sonnets, attentively and appreciatively, is Sir John Suckling, 1609-1642. He incorporated half a dozen verbal reminiscences in his tragedy Brenneralt, written about 1640. Let me give you that again. The only early 17th century writer who can be shown to have read the 1609 quarto of Shakespeare's sonnets attentively and appreciatively is Sir John Suckling. He incorporated half a dozen verbal reminiscences in his tragedy Brenneralt, written about 1640. This piece of information has answered a question that has exercised me off and on for the past 56 years. How is it that Suckling, who otherwise appears one of the multifarious hangers-on and hangers-around of poetry, could write one of the very finest of 17th century secular lyrics. It reads as follows. I pray thee spare me, gentle boy. Press me no more for that slight toy, that foolish trifle of an heart. I swear it will not do its part, though thou dost thine, employst thy power and art. For through long custom it has known the little secrets, and is grown sullen and wise, will have its will, and like old hawk, pursues that still that makes least sport, flies only where it can kill. Some youth that has not made his story will think perchance the pains of the glory and mannerly sit out love's feast. I shall be carving of the best rudely call for the last course for the rest. And oh, when once that course is past, how short a time the feast doth last. Men rise away and scarce say grace, or civilly once thank the face that did invite, but seek another place. Let me read it again. I pray thee spare me, gentle boy. 
Press me no more for that slight toy, that foolish trifle of an heart. I swear it will not do its part, though thou dost thine, employst thy power and art. For through long custom it has known the little secrets and is grown sullen and wise. Will have its will, and like old hawks, pursues that still that makes least sport, flies only where it can kill. Some youth that has not made his story will think perchance the pains, the glory, and mannerly sit out love's feast. I shall be carving of the best, rudely call for the last course, for the rest. And oh, when once that course is past, how short a time the feast doth last. Men rise away and scarce say grace, or civilly once thank the face that did invite, but seek another place. This is a lyric poem of four stanzas, each stanza rhyming A, A, B, B, B. The meter in each stanza is four lines of tetrameter plus a final pentameter. The fifth line addition of one beat is significant in effect when the poem is spoken aloud. The one extra pulse made up of two extra syllables conveys a palpable effect of reflection, a sense of turning back, turning upon, rehearsing the sentiment, so that in its cumulative effect, the poem ceases to be the flippant, cynical expostulation that would have been expected by those familiar with Suckling's pose as a cavalier libertine. His poem is made, made in quotation, a piece of powerful eloquence. His poem is fabricated, if you like, a piece of powerful eloquence by a formal decision that could so easily have meant ruin. His theme is that of sexual encounter, liaison, satiety. And in stanza one, line one, his idiom is that of a residual mannered commonplace, the little god of love. If someone were to leap up and repost, nonsense, it's a choir boy from the Chapel Royal. I wouldn't subsequently cut them in the street or gather a mob to wreck some harmless pediatrician's office. And there is always, of course, a pseudo Rochester's, and missing my lass, I fall on my page. Nonetheless, the stalest of cliches is required here by the theatre of the poem. And just about the stalest on offer anywhere is that of Cupid, the boy god of sexual cupidity. We speak idly of Petrarchan sexual stylization, which is unjust to Petrarch. And we intend by this the reduction of human relationships in sex to jaded conformism. And this very fact is oxymoronically the poem's triumph beginning or seeming to begin as it does as yet another instance of cavalier offhandedness, cavalier spelt with a small c, it takes on an ever-increasing objectivity so that in the final stanza it is scrutinizing its own apparent premises as set out in the first stanza in a way that is unique in cavalier poetry, spell that with a capital C. Retrospectively, judging by the poem's final effect, we could point to stanza two, line two, as the phrase of transition, the little secrets. Following the flippancy of stanza one, it could be more of the same. But it begins the dramatic placing of the kind of glib triviality that we are told, both by Suckling and by his critics, to expect 
By the time we reach stanzas three and four, Suckling is closely observing morally rather than indulging himself conventionally, if he ever was, which I doubt. Stanza two has a old hawks, oxymoronically impacting intense appetite and incapacity. Contrast the amorous birds of prey in a poem published some considerable time later, Marvel's To His Coy Mistress. Suckling's pitch also anticipates the maimed debauchee of the Earl of Rochester, whom I will here describe as, in his way, a severe moralist, a way of putting it that may surprise some of those present. Suckling's deployment of these commonplaces, a commonplace is not necessarily a cliché, is superb. The brutal resonance of his kill Stanza two, final word, strikes through the gamey context. And here, as also in stanza four, we may note how effectively the triple rhyme, will, still, kill, is used to determine a sense at once persistent and inert. I've used the term brutal and the term is appropriate to the nature of love's feast, as here suggested, I shall be carving of the best, rudely call for the last course for the rest, before the rest. It's brutal, it's banal, uh, deliberately so. I do not think that the poet is complicitous with the brutality and the cynicism to which you may well retort. The poem is written throughout in the first person singular. First person singular equals self-expression. Surely the poet stands condemned by his own utterance. To which I respond. The first person singular is as much a dramatis persona in this poem as to the third person singular, standing in for the first person singular is a dramatis persona in Clarendon's autobiography, roughly contemporaneous with Suckling. If the I is implicated in this poem, it is because the self must engage in self-judgment as representing the commonplace actor in a tragic comedy of corrupt mores. The poem is presenting what such a sated, repetitive kind of sexuality produces. Recall from my inaugural lecture that line of Yeats, the final line of the sonnet, Leader and the Swan, before the indifferent beak could let her drop. It is as if Suckling is playing out ahead of Yeats all these semantic permutations of indifferent in the process of this 20-line lyric, although, of course, that particular word does not appear in it. The ability to dramatize self-disgust and self-contempt with such technical aplomb that the accused ego squirming inside the poem is simultaneously the judge presiding and the barristers arguing the case. From where does Suckling derive the rhetorical potency to present this petty assize? Well, I can now say with some confidence, thanks to pages 72 to 74 of the Arden edition, that it derives from an attentive and appreciative reading of Shakespeare's sonnet. Enjoyed no sooner, but despised it straight. Past reason hunted and no sooner had, past reason hated as a swallowed bait. Sonnet 129. If eyes corrupt by over partial looks, be anchored in the bay where all men ride. Why of eyes falsehood hast thou forged hooks? 
whereto the judgment of my heart is tied. My God, how wonderful that is. That wonderful play on ride in its nautical sense of ships riding at anchor and the sexual implications of, of ride, man riding woman. Or, according to taste, woman riding man. But there it is, so wonderfully nailed. Be anchored in the bay where all men ride. Oh, my God. Sonnet 137. If only, if only, if only. If only one had a gift for words. I would here point to a recurring double effect that I find in late 16th, early 17th, 17th century poetry. Um, an effect that I have decided to call connotative flattening and denotative sharpening. To give an immediate instance of flattening, look at the final stanza of Suckling's I Pray Thee Spare Me Gentle Boy, which I've read twice but not discussed yet. And oh, when once that course is past, how short a time the feast doth last. Men rise away and scarce say grace, or civilly once thank the face that did invite, but seek another place. Face, in the penultimate line of the stanza and of the poem, is shockingly transformed and transformative. Transformed from what precisely? From the kind of transcendent display encountered in A, Book 1, Canto 12, stanza 23, lines 1 to 3 of the Fairy Queen, and in B, Epithalamion, also by Spencer, lines 117, 120. A. The blazing brightness of her beauty's beam and glorious light of her sunshiny face to tell were as to strive against the stream. B. Fair sun, show forth thy favourable ray and let thy lifeful heat not fervent be for fear of burning her sunshiny face her beauty to disgrace. Set against Spencer's image of the sunshiny face of the woman, Suckling's use of face strikes with a shocking effect of nullity, of dehumanization. I shall push my argument to breaking point by proposing that Spencer's presentation of the woman's face and Suckling's demonstrate practically my theory of the oxymoron. Spencerian hyperbole switched into its rhetorical opposite, whatever the word for that is. I had hoped it would be hyperbole, but I looked it up and to my disappointment that seems to mean something entirely different. In this world of callous self-interest, Suckling's poem declares, one meets faces, not people, and the faces are without names. Suckling died nine years before Hobbes's Leviathan was put into print. But what could Hobbes have told Suckling about mankind's natural uncivil egotism that he hadn't already observed for himself. In the now superseded 1910 edition of Suckling's works, the editor A. H. Thompson wrote, I think one has to put one's fingers together for such pronouncements, there is no depth of feeling in Suckling's poetry. <laughs> He evidently prided himself on its absence. The deep emotions of the poet were no part of the equipment of a gentleman. 
It is true that courtly mannerism as a way of life might be open to description in such terms, but to fail to see how this poem by Suckling masters the limitations of the milieu is critical obtuseness. It's like trying to write off the music of William Laws as entertainment music for the Caroline Court. It is partly, but Laws tells it in his music like striving against the stream. Suckling's poem's witness, as I shall term it, is in its achieving the trickiest of effects. It restores morality and compassion to an environment that has none. And it does so entirely in the force of its oxymoronic vitality, its eloquent nullity. Set the suckling and the Spencer side by side and it is Spencer's sunshiny face that appears drained of significance. The effect of flattening can be observed elsewhere in lyric and dramatic poetry and in prose of the 16th and 17th centuries. I give here A, three lines from Act 3, Scene 13 of Kids, the Spanish Tragedy, and B, part of a sentence from John Bunyan's The Pilgrim's Progress, 1678, The Trial of Faithful at Vanity Fair. A, kid. Nor aught avails it me to menace them who as a wintry storm upon a plain will bear me down with their nobility. B. Bunyan. My old Lord Litchery, Sir Having Greedy, with all the rest of our nobility. Kid A. Presents Geronimo, a high-ranking official but no aristocrat, planning private revenge upon the aristocratic murderers of his son. Private because he knows their position to be unassailable by the resources of public justice and equity. His nobility is drained of the noble virtue that Spencer tells Raleigh it is his aim to celebrate in the Fairy Queen. Kid's nobility equates to Raleigh's external men. Some 80 or so years later, Bunyan is using precisely the same flattening effect to evoke the mere externals of cruel and vindictive pomp, lacking all of that virtuous and gentle discipline belonging to nobility that Spencer celebrates in his oratorical letter to Raleigh. As to my insistence that an opposite sharpening effect can also be described, I give three instances. A, a brief poem, Stand Who So List, by the Henrician courtier poet Thomas Wyatt. B, one stanza from a poem by Walter Raleigh, The Lie. And C, one line from Ben Jonson's Roman play, Sir Janus. A, Wyatt. Stand whoso list upon the slipper top of court's estates, and let me here rejoice, and use me quiet without let or stop, unknown in court that hath such brackish joys. In hidden place, so let my days forth pass, that when my years be done, without a noise, I may die aged after the common trace. For him death grippeth right hard by the crop that is much known of other, and of himself, alas, doth die unknown, dazed with dreadful face. B. Raleigh. Say to the court it glows and shines like rotten wood. Say to the church it shows what's good and doth no good. If church and court reply, then give them both the lie. 
See, Ben Johnson, to hide his ulcerous and anointed face. As to A, the Wyatt, he's here making a paraphrase of a chorus from Seneca's Latin play, Thyestes, Stet quicumque volet potens aulae culmine rubrico. Uh, Andrew Marvel and Rochester laid, later made versions of the same Seneca chorus, also fine, but Wyatt's is the finest. The three phrases to which I would especially attach the term sharpening, and which are essential to the voice of the English version, are instances of Wyatt's adding to the original Latin, brackish joys, he adds, brackish water is fresh water contaminated by salt water, for the tainted ambrosias of the Henrician court. For him, death grippeth right hard by the crop, crop as in neck and crop, dazed with dreadful face, full of dread and dreadful to behold. The sharpening consists of giving wrenchingly idiomatic English vernacular twists to what in the Latin original are somewhat stately stoic commonplaces. Illi mors gravis incubat, qui notus nimis omnibus ignotus moritur sibi. On him death heavily lies, who, known too much to many others, unknown dies to himself. I would add that, that in this brief poem, Wyatt is combining in his own voice three pitches which I will call the curial, the forensic, and the proverbial. The synthesis had been achieved before in English verse, I think particularly of the Temple of Mars episode in Chaucer's The Knight's Tale, but Wyatt's achievement is to bring that kind of Chaucerian, sardonic, heroic weight down into the lyric form. And this is a tightly compressed lyric of only 10 lines, and of compacted, indeed impacted English. For him death gripeth you can all, for him death gripeth right hard by the crop. To read that line aloud is a constricting experience. Try it, but not here. I say of the Raleigh stanza that it sharpens, makes sardonically shrill the hyperbole of courtly lyric. Unlike the suckling poem, which sardonically flattens the tones of cavalier sexual triumphalism. Say to the court it glows and shines, like what? Like the rich jewel in an Ethiop's ear, beauty too rich for use, for earth too dear, Romeo and Juliet. No, like rotten wood, inert in the self-consuming phosphorescence of decay. I'm sorry that there's a clock up there because you'll, you'll be able to see that I'm going to overrun by about five minutes. Could we have it covered up next time? Thank you. In the instance of the line from Ben Jonson's Sir Janus, in order to evaluate the remarkable sharpening effect achieved by Jonson's acute linguistic intelligence, we have to set it against the Latin original Tacitus, Tacitus Annals, Book 4, at 57.3. Ulcerosa facies at plurumque medica minibus interstincta. Ulcerous face, and with many cosmetics medications daubed. In Act 4, line 174 of Johnson's play, the Republican Latiaris speaks rashly and treasonably of Tiberius Caesar. Johnson draws heavily both for plot and language on Tacitus's annals without being derivative precisely. The leap of the imagination from the Latin interstincta to the English and anointed demonstrates this. Anointed suggests both smeared with ointment cosmetic and marked with the sign of royal legitimacy. As in Shakespeare's Richard II, Act Three, not all the water in the rough rude sea can wash the balm off from an anointed king. Balm, the oil used to anoint a king at his coronation. Johnson was a royalist legitimist 
and in a way is implying that Tiberius is a bastard, but a legitimate bastard. Uh, Elizabethan Jacobean dramatists have an ambivalent approach to legitimacy when it has been gained by unscrupulous force majeure. Witness the difficulty that Shakespeare's Henry V has in squaring his conscience with the fact that he is the heir to a usurper, a despot. A character such as Henry Bolingbroke, Henry IV parts one and two, is so to speak illegitimately legitimate. What I've been saying throughout this lecture is how good it is to see the capacities of the English language used to the full by poets who are capable of rising to the strongest demands made upon their linguistic intelligence by the impacted natures of public and private life. I'm aware that such statements must sound at once excessively dogmatic and insufficiently cross-referenced. If I were allowed to set the ground rules for writing poetry in English during the next 20 years, what kind of behemoth would it be? It might be helpful if you were to regard me throughout my stint in the chair, whether that be long or short, as the merest travesty of Socrates at the time of his trial and the drinking of the hemlock. <laughs> in saying this, my point of reference is A.D. Nuttall's remarkable book, Overheard by God, Fiction and Prayer in Herbert Milton, Dante and St. John, first published 31 years ago. Nuttall writes, the excuse of Socrates for his appalling incivility was that he had seen something incommensurate with the world he inhabited. The excuse of Socrates for his appalling incivility was that he had seen something incommensurate with the world he inhabited. Not all quotes from four lines from a George Herbert poem. Oh, who will show me those delights on high? Echo, I. Thou echo, thou art mortal, all men know. Echo, no. He comments in the poem, the blankness of the echo is almost too easily defeated by the little miracle of literary ingenuity. Each repetition is made into a perfectly meaningful and intelligible answer. But in Jesus' answer to Pilate, thou sayest that I am, he states an element of blank intransigence, which is less easily dispelled. In these lectures, I hope to contain both the little miracles of literary ingenuity and the blank intransigence. It is the blank intransigence that I hope you will carry away with you. Who saith our times nor have nor can produce us a black swan? Ben Jonson. In brief, what I'm saying to any youngish poet who may be listening is produce us a black swan. Not so much as a beautiful arresting image, more as a beautiful arresting technical revelation learned from a disciplined study of the technical achievements of our most accomplished predecessors. In the Guardian of the 23rd of February this year, under the title Mike Skinner, Poet Laureate of Giza Rap, <laughs> I read a piece by Dave Simpson, which contains the following. Let's push things forward, couples dazzling wordplay, 
The plot thickens, put on your mittens for these sub-zero conditions. With club culture, garage and dub, and a state of the nation address that hurtles from London Bridge to burning Brixton. State of the nation is in. P.J. Harvey is currently shrilling, let England shake. But what dazzling wordplay. Presumably thickens is supposed to rhyme with mittens and conditions, and if not, care should have been taken to avoid the suggestion. <laughs> and what have plots ever done but thicken? I mean, this may not be true rap, but my criticism of State of the Nation protest songs, and that may include rap, is not that it is violent, but that compared to the inventiveness of even a minor poet such as Suckling, it is so verbally inept. It may be symptomatic of the incommensurate in our time, but it does not master it in the way all major art can and should. And believe me, a piece of major art can be four lines long, and a minor piece of art can extend to 25 cantos. Full of goodwill, I, I bought the P.J. Harvey. Here it is. <laughs> I had half the counter staff of HMB bowing me to the door. <laughs> and I saw what they were thinking. If some old tramp can throw away his money on PJ Harvey, the economy must be on the men. <laughs> But as I took it home, and as I listened to the attenuated wailing of stock epithet after stock epithet, what did I feel? Not entirely displeased, to tell you the truth. <laughs> At least I thought, I shall be able to round off my second Oxford lecture with a final oxymoron. And if somebody says, what on earth is your final oxymoron? I shall say, I will explain that in my next term's lecture. <laughs> Thank you.